Hello, friends, and welcome back again to another episode of the Dubcast with Dubside. I'm Andrew Alzaga. And I'm Dubside, and we're up to Dubcast number 10. Not, not counting the other, the other interviews that come in now and then. So, Dubside, I was looking on YouTube today, and I found this really interesting video of a guy who made a Greenland paddle using only a hatchet. A hatchet? Wow. Yeah. So uh, he doesn't even use any sandpaper. Uh, the video is just him making this paddle using only a hatchet. Wow, that's pretty cool. Have you ever watched the Greenlanders make paddles? Um, not really. You know, when I get there, they're in a rush to get the competition started, and you know, I'm not there throughout the winter when they're doing all their other preparation work there. They're usually still painting the kayaks mm. for the last couple of coats of paint on the on the racing kayak often. So a lot of the paddles I've seen, they they don't look all that great because they don't have great wood there. You know, they they have to take what they get. You know, we yeah. we can go to the, the local hardware store and go through the the two by four selection and find some nice straight grain, a decent piece. But up there, they might have stuff with with knots on, just nasty, you know, lousy wood because that's that's what they got. You know. Being resourceful people, some of the greeners like John Peterson have come to this country have taken paddles back with them <laughs> because they know a good paddle and they see one. They see somebody's got a nice wooden paddle, a good two-piece. Oh, I can get that back on a plane. They'll, they'll take it back with them. That's what I really admire about uh, the Greenlanders is their resourcefulness. And, um, yeah. you know, obviously it comes from a culture that evolved in a very um, harsh environment. Yeah. Did you know or study much about the Greenland culture before you went to Greenland? Um, not not all that much, no. So it was an interesting experience to, to be there. So I was happy to see that the, the language is alive and well. If you go on the other other side of the continent, the Aleuts, their whole culture is not nearly survived. Mm. You know, the, the language is more or less extinct, and the, you know, there's, there aren't any real people who have been paddling all the way through that you could talk to today about what it was like back then. And so it's, but Greenland is a different situation. And they, you know, with the, with the language and they got radio, they've got, you know, books being published, they have TV and everything. So everybody, they're, they're different dialects, but they, it, it's kind of encouraging. It's kind of nice to see that they still have that piece of their past as well as the land that they're living on. Mm-hmm. What did you find uh, appealing about the Greenlandic culture? That kept you interested in, in uh, interested in studying it. Culturally, you know, they, they do have that coming from the old days that that humble kind of thing going on, where they don't like to brag about themselves. I somehow gravitate to that. Like, I, I I get so tired of the the way people talk in hyperbole and saying everything is just the greatest and that kind of language. You know, you have to scale it back to what what they really mean because they overstated what they said. Where it was agreement the other way around, but. But it's interesting to, to see those two orientations interact with each other. Situations like a job interview, you just get run over by the other people who have overbuilt themselves. And being being modest doesn't really help you because there's a time when you really need to say, look, here are my skills. I'm really good for this job. Whereas, whereas you know, be, they'd be more like understating what they can do kind of thing. And then the inner city, the, that kind of homeboy thing, you know, it's, like rap music, the underlying theme of rap music, at least originally, was you know the, I'm I'm the best and you're the worst kind of thing. It's yeah. all this building up yourself, and so that kind of orientation applied to the, to the Greenland situation is just they're the direct opposite. The one is overbuilding themselves, the other one's underbuilding themselves, and so the influence of modern culture on Greenland, you'll see kids picking up that whole rap kind of thing and trying to to be like, look, I'm so great. But in Greenland, it looks kind of odd because that's not how things really were. And so you can see the influence of that with some kids and then other kids. When I see the competition, you know, some, some of these kids are a little more quiet and reserved and they might be very good. And they seem to be more like the old seal hunters. But other kids are more like, look at me, I'm so cool, you know, which is <laughs> more the modern influence. That clash of those two cultures just happens right there. That's really interesting. You know, when I first met Maligiak, I think it was uh, when he was visiting here in Washington in Anacortes at uh, Corey Friedman's Skin Boat School. And mm-hmm. uh, I ran into some people uh, who said, oh, Maligiak's here. I met Maligiak. 
And the first word that they used to describe him was that he was very humble. Yeah. Yeah, he was surprising. He was a surprisingly humble person. Yeah. I find that very interesting. And it really corresponds with um, what you mentioned before about the way old seal hunters talk about themselves yeah. and about their accomplishments. It seems to be like a very strong feature of the Greenlandic culture. Yeah. Hey, it would be really interesting to uh, hear some of that Greenlandic rap music sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they do have Greenlandic rap. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll come up with a version of it. I'll see what I can do. All right. Okay, well, without further ado, let's get on to dubcast number 10. All right. Welcome to the dubcast. With Dubside. This is dubcast number 10. In which I will tell you all about the Greenlandic language. And I will give you the full translation of the kayak song, as I've promised earlier. When I am not tipping a kayak over on purpose or swinging on ropes doing Greenlandic rope gymnastics, or taking a folding kayak on public transportation, I on occasion engage in activities that could be considered normal, such as going to the movies. I only do that when someone else is paying for it, but about five or ten years ago, I was out with some people I knew, and we went to see a feature new release, and it was one of those space themed movies. I can't even remember the name of it. I think it was um, some some big name actress and um, George Clooney was the male role. And it was there they're out and they're out in space floating around weightless and doing something on their space capsule and then they getting hit by the asteroid. The space junk is floating around. They have to be careful about getting hit and so at some point there's there's some big disaster and they have to I think George Clooney I forget what happens to him. <laughs> but, so so the, the woman, she has to get back to Earth. And she's orbiting around and, and trying to, to, to come in through the atmosphere. And I guess she gets through the atmosphere and, and she has to, to figure out where she is. She's got this radio. Um, she's listening in on the, on the airwaves and just dialing in for whatever voice, whatever she can pick up. And these, so she hears these strange voices speaking some other funny language, and they're going, you know, something, 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 something. And it's something, something, uanga, something, something, something. And I'm sitting there in the theater thinking, wait, uanga? I know that word. That's the first word of the kayak song. They're speaking Greenlandic. And I'm, I'm, I'm nudging the people next to me, that's Greenlandic, it's Greenlandic, they're speaking, it's Greenlandic. And later on, at the end of the film, the credits come up, and it, it was Greenlandic. They were actually speaking Greenlandic. And I, I never would have guessed that some mainstream movie would have pieces of the actual Greenlandic language in it, but it was in that movie for that little piece of it. And it'd say, Uwanga, and I, I, I couldn't quite pick up the rest of what, what was said there, but Uwanga, the word for me or I, that's Greenlandic. Since the first time I went to Greenland in 2004, I have been trying to learn Greenlandic, and I will tell you, it is a very difficult language for an English speaker to learn. Um, I, I started out by buying this phrase book they have a, in their tourist shops. It's called Greenlandic for Travelers, first published in 1993 in a Danish and an English version. In the years since, it's, it's gone out of print a couple times, and they've printed up a new batch of it, so it's available here and there. It's, it's your, your basic, you know, phrases in Greenlandic, you know, hello, hi, how are you? And, you know, you get the, get the store, you know, do you have any bread? Do you have, you know, just, just basic uh, things to say. There, there, there's not a whole lot of extensive grammar. You're, you're not going to be fluent reading this book, but you're going to get, get an idea of how to no, negotiate your way around in some situations. They have the the uh, Greenlandic spelling and then pronunciation for it, but I found that with Greenlandic, you really have to hear it. You can't just reading it and, and reading tips on how to pronounce things doesn't quite 
come close, you have to really hear someone else say it. The first thing I really learned was the names of the Greenlandic rolls, because on the Kayak USA website, qajaqusa.org, they had the names of the rolls in Greenlandic and the audio files you could hear. I think it was Maligak saying those names um, from, from way, way back. So that was, that's was that been available for a long time. And I put those on a little uh, digital voice recorder that I could keep in my pocket all the time and just walk around and play those to myself. And, and that's how I eventually got the, the Greenlandic rolls down. Inaka Chinook, the side's called Pashlu Chinook, chest skull. See, they're just rolling off my tongue. And trying to get a handle on the pronunciation of the Greenlandic language, I think it helps to uh, consider the development of this language historically over, over centuries, over millennia. And you know, any, any language is going to develop according to the conditions that, it's, that the people that that uh, speak it are in. And so you got to remember that the Arctic is the Arctic and there's temperatures can range down to 40, 50 below zero and, and lower and you'll have wind. Um, and so living in, in harsh conditions like that, um, the, the Greenlandic word for thank you, as an example, we'll look at that. So it's koyanok. Q-U-J-A-N-A-Q, Koyanok. And notice I'm not saying Koyanak, I'm saying Koyanok. And so if you consider, say, our English version of that word is thank you, thank you. Now that th, that T-H, I have to put my tongue between my teeth, th, and then breathe out, th, thank you. Now if you were in the Arctic and the temperature was 40 degrees below zero, and the wind was blowing, so the wind chill was what seventy degrees below zero. Do you think you would say th- you would say any word that would require you to put your tongue outside your teeth like that th- in that kind of weather? No. <laughs> A much better way to say that word would be koyonok. See, I, I, that that the whole word is in the back of my throat. Koyonok. I my I could be in freezing conditions, you know way below freezing with the wind blowing koyonok, koyonok. See, I I can say that without endangering my tongue by sticking it outside of my teeth. Thank you. So that makes a lot of sense. And I I met a guy once in Canada who had been to Greenland years back a number of times, knew quite a bit about Greenland. That's why we went to see him. Interesting guy. And he told me a story about, he went to the dentist one time and, you know, to get a filling or something. And so they, they, they Novocaine you, you know, they numb your whole mouth out so you you don't feel any pain. And for the next several hours when you go home, you your lips are so numb, you're like, hello, hello, how are you? And so, you know, someone talking to him or him answering the phone, they couldn't really understand what he was saying, but he could speak Greenlandic just fine. <laughs> because it's all on the back here. My, my, my uh, lips can be Im- immo- immobile, and I can still say, but is going to come out muffled. So that's, that's a way to think about Greenlandic. If, you, if the front of your, your, your lips, your mouth is completely numb, you can still say it all on the back of your throat. It's all the way in the back there. Now, I could keep saying more Greenlandic words, and the more I say, the more you're going to forget. I know that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll give you one or two. Um, and one, one, a very useful word, a very common word in Greenlandic, very good all-purpose word, it's ayungilok. And this word translates to, like, it's okay, it's good, it's all right, it's fine, everything, you know, it's just a positive thing. All right. Ayungilok. Ayungilok. And I've gone around in Greenland and recorded people. And that, in fact, that phrase book I told you about, that phrase book, I have every page of that phrase book over, over the past five or ten years. Over time, I built up. So I have every single word on every page of that, of that book in, uh, recorded. And I've chopped it up into little files so I have the word or the phrase, and then four seconds of silence, and then me saying it in English. And then I, 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 you know, throughout 
in my travels or wherever I am, I just have that on headphones and play it all the time and sort of can learn some Greenlandic phrases. I'm, I, I still can't hold a conversation in this difficult language, but I, I, I know some phrases that way. So just hearing the phrase, and it works much better than, than seeing it written down for me. You actually hear how it's said. So I have Maligiak. I have many of the Greenlanders who've come to this country for some of the kayak events. is John Peterson, Adam Hansen, uh, Yena Padilla. I have them saying things on, on, on my little recorder and then I can listen to them. So for example, so I'll say Ayungilak, but here's here's how Maligiak says it. Ayungilak. Ayungilak. Now in the Greenlandic language, the negative is formed by that ungi sound, N N G I. So technically the word Ayungilak is the negative of Ayopok. That would be spelled A J O R P O Q. And ayopok means that uh, it's it's no good. It it sucks. It's if you some, something is broken instead of out of order, they'll just write ayopok on it. So it's ayopok is it's no good. And ayungilak is everything's fine. Or it, it's good. So so ayungilak, you're you're technically saying it is not no good. That's their everything's fine phrase. Like it's not terrible. It's not broken out of order. It's it's in other words, it's good. And I, one year we were staying at, uh, I think they were serving, this was in, in Pamut in South Greenland. They, they, we were eating meals during the competition at a uh, at the, the fish factory that they had for the workers. They had a cafeteria there. And there was also, they, they have provisions for if you need to do some laundry. And so there was a la- laundry room there where they would wash all the, the uniforms for the, the people working there. And so we were able to, as the kayak kayakers at the competition, use that. And I went in there one one morning to, to, to wash something and trying to find, you know, how how things work. It's all written on the walls in Greenlandic and I can't understand anything. And there was a woman there and she, she didn't speak didn't speak English, but she you know, friendly person. And she was I, I sort of indicated Panama I mean that I wanted to wash something and she sort of showed me what to do. And then she w- she was describing her her job, how she worked. And she would pick up something, look at it, says, Ayungilak, Ayapok, Ayungilak, Ayapok. <laughs> Meaning, you know, like, this one's dirty, this one's clean, this one's dirty, this one, you know, this one's good, this one's no good. That's, that, was, that was her day. Ayungilak, Ayapok, Ayungilak, Ayapok. Another confusing thing about Greenlandic for an English speaker is that the, the structure of the sentences is backwards from what we're used to. So if I were saying something like, I see it, or I, I don't see it, it's the subject I, and then don't is the not, and then see is the verb, and it is the object. In Greenlandic, that would be starting with the verb, and then the negative don't, and then I, it. So it'd be taku is the verb, and takungi would be not, not, whatever verb it was, and takungi, takungi lara, so is would be, lara is I to it. So see, not I, it is what actually is the, the, what's going on in, in a Greenlandic speaker's head, whereas we've got the other way around. So when you translate over from one to the other, it gets very confusing, disorienting. Another feature of the Greenlandic language is there is no different uh, pronouns for male or female. It's uh, completely gender neutral. Everything is just it or they. So you'll hear someone who's not fully fluent in English, who speaks Greenlandic, they'll, they'll translate and they'll say, you know, like, I saw your mom and he said hi. And then they, they, if you're correct, then they're like, oh, okay, that's right. But he, she, she, because it, it, they're just not used to trying to match the, the pronouns like that. They don't have separate pronouns. And every time in Greenland I'm buying whatever else I can find as far as the language goes, so there's... There are a number of books, dictionaries, and grammar books about the Greenlandic language. However, just about all of them are in Danish. So to build up one's collection of materials, you have to get a Danish to English dictionary, and then you have to sort of learn Greenlandic through Danish. And if you don't know Danish, well, that's just one extra step in the process. Now, they make Rosetta, Rosetta Stone programs for Danish, but they don't make one for Greenlandic, at least they don't yet. I guess it's a limited market. There's other people have attempted um, smaller ventures and making. There's a 
CD-ROM and some other materials, and I've looked at all those, got all that I can, but it's still, it's, I am not fluent in this language. The, the main, most detailed book, there's a, there's a book on it, several hundred pages, and it's the Greenlandic to Danish, and there's a thicker book, which is the, the Danish back to Greenlandic, those two volumes, and now they're, they're smaller things, there's a, there's a smaller one that has Greenlandic, Danish, English for a number of phrases, but it's not nearly as, as exhaustive. Um, and then in, in, in 1973, they changed the spelling of all the words because before that, the original, the original missionary who wrote out the language, I think that was in the 1600s or maybe the 1700s, he used some letters like, that we don't have in English, like the A with a little line over it and E with dots or something like that. And so in 1973, they decided to standardize, so they changed it all around. So they, they took all those letters out. So instead of A with, with lines over it, it might be two A's. So the words all got longer. And some of the older names of people, they're still using the old spelling because that's what they were, they were named back then. So in fact, that, the, uh, that uh, song we listened to the other time by Isavarak Petrusen, Isavarak, his, his name is spelled with the with the old strange letters because that was before seventy three the the earlier type of spelling. So I was in Copenhagen. And I'm usually there um, every year, and then going from there to Greenland and coming back, and things to do in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And you perusing the uh, old bookstores in Copenhagen, you know, in the tourist area there. Very nice to walk around and browse, and they have these. Bookstores with you know lots of I, I I'll go in and look for the the Arctic section see if I can find some Greenlandic stuff, and I went into to one and they had, they had some old books and I asked the guy you know excuse me I can I if you got books on Greenland the Greenland Atlantic language, and he said oh well, there we in the in special the special section in the back where the old book, the really old books are, well, uh, there's some things back there. And he told, took me back through the passageways into the deeper recesses of the store. And there was a shelf, and it had, and, and you know, you, you'll find things, but they're in Danish, so, well, you know, that's, that's not going to help me tremendously. But, you know, sometimes I buy the things that are in Danish. And so I, I find this, it's an old book. It was 1927. It was a Greenlandic Dictionary. Greenlandic to English, and that was much more desirable. Um, didn't have to go through any other language to see what it said. So Greenlandic to English dictionary. Well, it did, didn't have a section of English to Greenlandic, just Greenlandic to English, but in in actual English, 1927, they wanted, this is an old book, they wanted 1,500 Danish kroners, which that is about, at the time, that, that's about $200, now, two hundred dollars is a lot more than I'm going to spend on a book. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, that's that'd be nice to have that book, but you know, two hundred bucks is a lot of money, particularly on my budget. But before I left the store, I thought about it, and I thought to myself, you know, if I don't buy this book from here on out, I'm going to think, you know, that time in that bookstore in Copenhagen, I should have bought that book. Every time I'm stuck in some Greenlandic trying to look translate something, I'm going to think, I should have had the book. So I said, I got to buy it. <laughs> I had 1,500 Danish kroners on me, and I, I talked to the guy at the store, and he took pity on me. I think, I think he dropped it down to, what, 1,250 Danish kroners, which is, I don't know, whatever that's, 150 bucks or something like that. So, so I bought it. I bought the book, and I have it, I have it to this day. Um, and I, I use it from time to time. It, it's still a little tricky because it's got the old spelling in there. And like they don't, the words like they don't always, it's hard to find the, the word because in the current spelling, because you have to match the old spelling. But, but it's, it, I'm not, I'm not, I have no regrets about buying that book. I'm glad I have it. There is one sound that they have in the Greenlandic language that's not, that we don't have that in the English language. I mean, you can, you can talk in the back of your throat, koyonok. But uh, you're, you're still saying words that, you know, sounds, syllables that we're familiar with. But there's one syllable that, that we don't have in the English language. And they spell it with two L's. And it's, it's you, you pronounce it by putting your tongue sort of to the top of your mouth and letting the air come out the sides of your mouth. And I've gotten to where I can a, approximate it and, and most Greenlanders can comprehend it. I don't know if I'm doing it exactly right, but it's... <laughs> So the, the the tricky word is a, a common common phrase when you someone says koyonok, 
And to say, you're welcome, it would say, ishushu, which is, there's two of those double L sounds, ishushu. Um, and it takes quite a while to, to get comfortable using that because we don't have that in the English language. So, ishushu, ishushu, you're welcome. And to make things more confusing, <laughs> there is there are regional dialects. And so in some places in Greenland, they speak quite differently from other places. I, I understand that East Greenland is quite different. I haven't been there. But so, for example, in, in uh, northern cities like uh, northern towns such as Iluliset and, and Asiat, they have a way of sticking an N in where it's, it's not spelled that way. They just put that in there. That's just the way they, they, they talk. So they'll say, instead of Maligyak, they'll say Maligyak. And there is, there is no N in Maligyak's name, but Maligyak is what you'll hear them say. And it's, not, it's not really Maligyak, it's just Maligyak. But a little subtle thing, but j- just to be more confusing. That's, that's in the tricky part about the language. So I've been recording things in Greenland every time I go. I have hours and hours. I, I've stopped doing it now because I have way too much. I can't even go through it. I'll, I'll listen to the KNR, the, the Greenlandic radio station, just hours and hours because you, you know, they come on and talk and it's just interesting to hear hear the sound of the language and then try to get make sense of it. But it's still very difficult to, to pull full sentences out of the what, what comes across the airwaves. I'll get a couple words here or there. And so whenever I'm there, I'll... I'll want someone to read something while I record them reading it so I can take it home. I have, you know, children's books that people have read for me and more grammar things, you know, from the grammar books, just page of things, all the verb tenses all the way through. Um, and every, it, during those, that time period, I, I, now I, I've got so much I don't need anymore, but, but back then I'd be in Greenland and, you know, the, the week of the competition, by the time the last day rolls around, I'm still thinking, oh, I should have got somebody to read this stuff. I, you know, I need more... I need I need to get some the most of my for coming all the way here. I, I want to take some recordings home to listen to them. And so I was in Nuuk. Nuuk is the big city. N U U K. Yes, sounds like the bomb. Nuuk, Nuuk in Greenland. And it was the last day I was there with one year. And I still had I had some some uh, pages of the grammar book, the verb tenses that I wanted I wanted to get those recorded. And I, there was a there's a Greenlandic bookstore that I'd been to, and I I talked to them. I bought some more books about grammar there, and so I went in there. I said, hey, could you could you just read this read these pages for me? I want to record this. And they said, well, it, I, we're, we're we're busy right now. We you know we have we're, the stores open here. You know, they, they 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 couldn't really stop what they were doing to to sit down for five or ten minutes and read things. So that 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 didn't work. So I had to give up on that. Um, and then I. I had money, you know, I had Danish kroners in my pocket left over and I, you know, I, you know, I need somebody to read a page for me. I've got money to pay them. How am I going to do this? And I figured I could, I could walk up to someone on the street out on the, the main street and just say, but then I, to record them on the busy street, I get all the street noise and, you know, I want to get a quiet, a, a clean recording of it. Um, and something, and I, if I just walk up to someone, I don't know if, if they speak really, if they enunciate really clearly or, you know, how well... I need somebody with a with a good sounding voice, um, and then I figure, well, you know, I I've got money, okay. I could I could rent a hotel room, e- e- you know, e- if if it's overnight, it doesn't matter. Just just you know, I'm 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 ready to spend money. I got <laughs> I need this to happen, um, so I could I could get a hotel room right there. That's a big big hotel in town, a nice quiet room. So I'd be going up to someone in the street and saying, "Excuse me, could you come to this hotel room with me, and I'll pay you." Well. That sounds a little shady. <laughs> I don't think, that doesn't sound good for walk up a stranger like that. So, so that that's not going to work. And at this point, all, all the people I knew from the competition, you know, the competition's over. They're they're back doing their day jobs. They're busy with their own activities. You know, and I need somebody to just read some Greenlandic for me. I'll pay them. How you know? Can I find somebody? What am I going to do here? And so, you know, I had an, an hour before my plane flew out. So, I found a very effective solution to this problem. Solved everything. I got my recording. Everything was fine. And this this solution was so clear and obvious and worked so well. And this would work in any, any country. I'll give you, till the end of the episode here, to think about that. And you can guess to see what would you do trying to get somebody to read and you could record them speaking their language. 
full translation of the kayak song. Verse number one. Uanga naminek. Uanga is I or me. Naminek is myself. So I myself. Next word, misiging, misigingilara. Misi is feel or experience, try. Misi, misingi would be not, so I'm not trying. Gilara. Lara is first person singular to third person object, so I, it. So, uanga naminek misingi gilara. It would be I myself have never tried it. Gisiani, but. Kayangua mik, about the kayak. Kayak is the kayak, but kayanguak would be a, a special, like a, a, a dear little kayak. So, kisiani kayangua mik, okalu tutila savagit. That's one word. Okalu would be speak or talk. Okalu tutila would be something like speaking about savagit, would be I. I to you, something like that. So anyway, I myself have never tried it, but about the dear little kayak, I would like to tell you something. Second verse, a mikisusia. So a, just the expression, oh, miki small. So mikisusia, it is so small. A amisusia, it is so narrow. Sumutsaku itasa imak. Imak is the water or the, the big water of the ocean. So, sumutsaku itasa imak. When you go out to the sea, aya perfisa kangilatit. See, these, these words, they start with a ba- basic word and just add on to them for the full, all sense and words. So, my 1927 dictionary says, aya perpok means supporting, supports the hand against something. So, ayapefisak, ayapefik would be the place where something supports your hand. Ayapefisakangi, there's the negative. Latit would be you. So anyway, it translates to, there's nowhere to support your hand, nowhere to, nowhere to hold yourself. So how small it is, how narrow it is, when you go out to sea, there's nowhere to support yourself. Third verse. Bingua na sutut. So bingua would be a toy. So like a toy. Second word, isingingilara. Isingingilara. E-C-C. Isingi. Isingi is not C. Isingingilara. Lara is that first person to third person object. So as, as a toy, resembling a toy, I don't see it like that. Biniakat, mekingesutut. So we have there. It's a hunter, like a like a hunter's tool. Sakutingup tokutam magit. So a, a tool like the hunter's harpoon kills big sea mammals. Tokut would be death there. So killing, killing sea mammals. So this, this kayak is used like. Hunter's harpoon killing big sea mammals. Fourth verse, Maligasa sutut. That'd be an example, and the tut at the end means as an example. Isigina para. Isi is that word seeing again. So isigina, like generally seeing, and para, I see it. So I see it, I, I generally see it as an example. Ima visup, that would be the big C. Mali suinut, akiutanera bishlugu, bishlugu about something. So it's it's made for the big seas and it can resist big waves. And last verse, sapili sangilak. Sapi would be sap, sapili would be failing, not being able to do something. So sapili sangi, the negative sangilak. So it, it it will never fail to do something. Kunuli sangilak, kunuli being afraid. So it is not afraid. It will never give up. Give up. It is never afraid. Up that would be yes. Up inu tamika kakisup. Um, if you get 
accustomed to do that. A person who gets accustomed to using the kayak, sungyu shluavitamani, a person who would be very confident and impressive. So the last verse of it, it will never give up, it is never afraid. Yes, a kayaker who gets accustomed to it is very confident and impressive. And going way back in Greenland, before electricity, they were making music, and they used a special drum, a little hand drum, they would tap on the sides of to get a beat, and had various chants and songs to that. And there do exist some historical recordings of these things going back up to 100 years. And they have been collected and uh, released on a CD. And I'm going to depart from the normal a little bit here. I'm going to actually use a sample of some of this music. Um, but I would encourage you to listen to the original. And I'm going to combine that with the kayak song to make a new version of the kayak song. And I've, I've left some of the verses out, but this is, uh, I used this uh, recording and this guy chanting this song sort of uh, matched. I sort of felt a, felt a connection through the uh, recording. Uh, and so this comes from, this is released on that Ulo Records, but it's a uh, subdivision called Sub Rosa. You can find this on their website, subrosa, S-U-B-R-O-S-A dot net. And the CD is called Inuit 55 Historical Recordings. I am sampling from track 33. And this is a guy named Inutuk Napa, recorded in 1962. It's called Tiguak's Song.
And there you have traditional Greenland singing and drumming. And again, I would recommend take a listen to Inuit 55 historical recordings uh, available from Sub Rosa Records. It's subrosa.net. You can find many selections of early Greenlandic chanting and drumming on atlanticmusic.gl. Well, if you're still wondering for the answer to my dilemma about getting someone to speak a different language and record them, it involves taxis, taxi drivers. (laughs) You just find a cab driver, say, do you speak whatever language you want them to speak? Say, pull over to the the back, back, around the corner here where it's a little quieter, close the windows so we get, block out some of the outside noise. And I will put this microphone on your steering wheel, clamp it on the steering wheel. I want you to just read this pa- these pages for me. Turn your meter on. Let the meter run. I will pay you the fare. Don't go anywhere. Just stay right here and read this for me. And once it went, I, the cab drivers I did this on, it took them a, a minute or two to figure out what the heck was going on. Once they once they realized what was what what the situation was, they were they were more than happy. They they. Guy gave me his business card. Hey, you got any more stuff you want me to record? Just give me, just give me a call anytime. They, you know, they, they don't have to burn any gasoline, and they're getting paid for their regular job. So, I was happy. They were happy. Your basic win-win situation. I stepped out of the cab and told him, "Ayungilok koyanok." Everything is cool. Thank you. Coming up in episode eleven. If you've ever seen a kayak called a Black Pearl kayak or paddled a Tahi Marine Greenland kayak, I'll tell you about the guys who designed those two kayaks. So until then, this is Dubside signing off, telling you, Oyanok. And the reply to that thank you is, Ishishu. Ishishu, you have to work on that. Ishishu. You're welcome.